Greetings Zimbabwe, Africa and the world. Welcome to In Conversation with Trevor, brought to you by Heart and Soul Broadcasting Services. I go beyond the headlines and beyond the sensational. This week I'm in conversation with Bishop Nguiza Mkandla, the Overseer for Faith Ministries Worldwide. I hope you find this conversation helpful as you deal with the loss of your loved ones and navigate the process of finding closure and healing during this pandemic season. Bishop uh, Nguiza Mkanda, welcome to In Conversation with Trevor. I'm so happy, Bishop, that you agreed uh, to do this, uh, to set aside uh, your busy diary and have this conversation with me. Welcome, Bishop. Thank you. I'm delighted to be on your program. <clears throat> so, Bishop, we decided uh, to have this conversation because of um, the pain that is all over the world, um, you know, because of uh, of COVID, the grief, uh, the deaths that we are we are witnessing. I mean, um, in Zimbabwe alone, we've had over a hundred thousand cases, um, three point three thousand three hundred deaths worldwide. We're talking of one hundred ninety four million cases, four point two million uh, deaths, and you sit in London. Uh, Bishop Nguiza, you are the overseer of uh, faith ministries worldwide. And for those people that don't know you, you were instrumental in the creation of uh, the Evangelical uh, Fellowship of uh, Zimbabwe. You also uh, have done quite a lot of work, uh, God's work, as I would want to call it, in planting over 10,000 churches uh, all across Zimbabwe. You started uh, faith ministries and grew it from one congregation to 50 congregations all across Zimbabwe. And uh, you were at one time the executive director of Zambuco Trust. But that's not what why we are, we are here. We're here specifically to look at COVID, uh, grief, uh, and the healing. Talk to me, um, uh, Bishop, from where you are right now in terms of what are you seeing as far as uh, uh, this situation is concerned? What's prevailing in Zimbabwe as far as grief uh, and healing is concerned? Trevor, we, we are in trouble at the moment. Um, the pandemic is uh, ravaging the country. Um, when we look at Zimbabwe, at some point we had thought that we had been spared from the pandemic. But sadly, you know, this third wave is just hitting us badly. People are dying. Mm. Um, from reports on the ground, obviously, we are monitoring, um, you know, the situation very closely. Um, we're reading the papers. And from the reports on the ground, things the, the, the picture is a very grim picture. Mm. Uh, we are losing a lot of people. And um, people are, are broken. Mm. Um, you know, in many quarters, there is, um, you know, hopelessness. Mm. Uh, fear has, you know, gripped people's hearts. And uh, there's just, um, you know, a lack of knowing uh, where to go. And in the midst of this, sometimes there isn't clear direction from, mm. you know, anyone in terms of um, the way forward. Mm. I mean, we, we will talk um, about my own personal circumstances uh, uh, Bishop, uh, lost a father, lost a mother, lost a niece uh, due to COVID all uh, in, in one week. But there are certain issues, uh, Bishop, which are specific, I think, to the continent and more uh, uh, precisely to Zimbabwe. What are the cultural issues that you see uh, at interplay uh, as far as the COVID, COVID deaths uh, and the healing and the grief are, are concerned? This situation flies across, I mean, against the face of um, some of our cultural practices. Um, Trevor, let's talk about some of the traditions that we grew up with. For instance, um, going right to basics, where if you heard that there was a death in the family, you dropped everything and you ran. <clears throat> 
Uh, it didn't matter what you were doing. You just needed to be at the, you know, a place where everybody was gathering. <clears throat> and <clears throat> then you've got the situation where we will gather for quite a few days and mourn together. <clears throat> the arrangements would be made while we are together. And uh, that is no longer the case now. Mm -hmm. uh, people are still trying to do that, but it's just flying against the signs that we've been, we've been advised you know, on. Um, you take a situation of <clears throat> uh, you know, viewing uh, the person who's mm -hmm. departed. Mm -hmm. um, we would pay our last respects um, by seeing the body. And there are situations, I can tell you, um, of a situation in my village where a body came from South Africa. They insisted on opening the body because uh, the, the, the casket, because they, they were not going to bury their child without seeing their child. As a result of that opening, five of the family members died a week after that. Mm. So these are some of the cultural norms that are having to be broken. We, we, we are being told that we shouldn't gather. Um, we shouldn't have vigils. Uh, we shouldn't come in our numbers. But culturally, you know how difficult you know, that is. So COVID is running against cultural norms. So what does that do, Bishop? The fact that you know, culturally, this is what we have been doing for centuries. But like you've outlined in your village, four people, five people uh, die after opening the casket of, uh, of uh, a deceased who was uh, COVID positive. So we, we, we're pushing against what science is saying we should do and what culture is saying we should do. And clearly the warning here is that science must take uh, the forefront. What does that do to us as we grieve um, uh, in this kind of situation? It is introducing a tremendous conflict within us uh, culturally. Um, some of the norms that we used to practice gave us closure. They gave us the ability to mourn together. Uh, there was, you know, that solace in, in comforting one another during those days when you were waiting for you know, the funeral and, you know, processing the funeral. And so you did this together and it brought comfort. It, got, it brought closure. Trevor, we don't have that anymore. Um, our, our relatives are dying in loneliness mm. and we, we do not have the opportunity to say goodbye to them. Yeah. And, this is breaking the nation. There's mm. just so much pain out mm. there. Uh, it's, 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 it's very difficult. Yeah, this is, this is we, we have to come to terms with a new norm, but this new norm is very, very difficult. It's very painful. It's a bitter pill to swallow. Yeah, you, you know, you've just brought to surface my own recent uh, uh, situation with the passing of my mother and, and my father. I think for me, uh, Bishop, help me here. Uh, the, the fact that um, uh, I'm, I'm in Harare, uh, I get a call that uh, dad is passed. Then the next two days, mom is passed. Fortunately with mom, I was able to go and identify her at, uh, at the funeral home. Uh, with dad, I never got that, uh, that, that, oppor that opportunity. So I feel I have not had that closure. Point number one. Point number two, when they're in hospital, we depended on uh, a nurse uh, or a doctor to find out how they were doing. They've been in hospital before. We visited them. You, 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 you sit by the bedside, you hold their hands, and you hear from them what, what was the problem, what is the pain. In this instance, right now, as I'm talking to you, Bishop, I have those questions. How did my mom die? What were the last seconds of her life? How, what were the last seconds of my, my father's life? Is there anything that he would have wanted to say? I've, I've, unfortunately, I'll never know that. Help me. How do I deal with that, Bishop? Um, uh, Trevor, this is a, this is a live uh, situation. Um, 
which is very typical of what is, you know, happening around us. I'm sorry, you know, for your loss. And um, yeah, um, it is a very, you know, painful situation. Uh, let me let me push back a little bit here, Trevor, because I think you will help a lot of your viewers by just, you know, sharing your experience in terms of just maybe responding to a few questions that I'll show sure. at you. Uh, how did, how did, t- tell us a little bit about the process when your father fell ill, your parents, fell, how did they fall ill? How long did it take? Uh, what was the genesis? What was the, 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 uh, the journey of their falling ill and, and eventually passing? The, the journey was, thank you, uh, uh, Bishop, for that question. The journey was uh, r- about seven days for, for both of them. Um, and um, in the first instance, we I get a call, we hear that uh, they are not well. Uh, it's flu, it's flu-like symptoms, uh, but we immediately the next day we rush them to to have them tested, and it's confirmed that they are they are both uh, COVID positive. Uh, we have a doctor who goes and sees them, uh, and then two three days down the line we hear that things are bad. They have to be dead in the first instance. My father has to be sub- ab- admitted in hospital. Mom remains behind, but three four five hours rather, uh, she collapses uh, because things have gotten bad. She's also rushed uh, to hospital, but they don't get to see each other. And one of the painful things, uh, Bishop, is that uh, we get told that uh, towards uh, dead at some point, the last night was was walking to the reception to find out, uh, to talk to somebody. Please, can you tell me how my wife is like? I gather she's in here. How is she feeling? She feeling? I spoke to my father uh, on, only once. So it, th- there's a, a sense of regret in me, uh, Bishop, that maybe I should have been firmer in insisting that they be vaccinated. Uh, I made a call that they be vaccinated. Uh, I was told something, I, I sort of uh, stepped a bit back and I didn't put my foot down to say, no, they should, they should have been vaccinated. So that's one of my regrets. Did I do enough to ensure that they got vaccinated. Those are some of the issues that I, I'm battling with. And I'm sure there's a lot of other viewers who battle with similar issues. You are a man of, I mean, a man in your position is, is, in, is, a, is, a, is in a position of means that you could have done uh, what needed to be done perhaps to save their lives. But how do you feel, you know, and not not having been able to to press any buttons to do anything to you know to to change their circumstance you know the 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 there's a the intellectual side of me and the spiritual side of me and and the rational side of me that says you know trevor it doesn't matter how much money you had if this is the time that god uh, had set for them there's little that you could have done but then the other side of me pushes back and says, no, uh, couldn't you have taken them to a better hospital? Could you have pushed uh, to have them vaccinated? You know, could, shouldn't you not have flown down to make sure that they are, they are in a good situ- situation? So I have lots of those ifs, uh, uh, Bishop, which unfortunately I cannot, I don't have answers to. And ultimately I have to say to myself, let me, let me accept fully what has happened? Let me resign myself and, and, and rather surrender myself completely to what God has allowed to happen. Is that a healthy way of looking at it? Well, you have no choice in a sense, uh, but um, one of the things that we must do is handle the emotions, um, uh, put on the table some of the questions that we have, the struggles that we have, because these struggles are very real. Tell me what impact, you know, this has had on you, uh, just processing your parents' that You, one minute, your parents were healthy people. They were, they were well. And within seven days, you know, you had lost them. Not only did you lose your parents, but you also lost a very close niece. That's three people within a very, how do you handle that? What impact does that have on you on a daily basis? It's, it's huge, um, Bishop. If I were to be honest with you and the viewers, I don't think it has even begun uh, to sink. Mm. Um, I have moments, 
I don't know how many times during the day when I want to pick up the phone and talk to my mother oh. and, and realize mm. that, no, she's no longer there. I have moments when I want to talk to my um, mother. Just yesterday, uh, coming out of the shower, I, was, I said to myself, oh, my niece Lorraine is going to love the episode of Film Conversation this week because mm. it's about acting. And then I realized, no, actually, that's not, that's not it. So th- there is this reality, Bishop, where I am aware physically that they're not here. I'm aware that they're not, they're not here. But there's a part of me that has not caught on with that, that keeps on saying, pick up the phone and call. Um, but so that's one level. The other level is this thing knocked me down for one week. I just could not do anything. I just could not do anything. Um, and then, you know, your, your blood pressure goes up. You, you, uh, I lose focus uh, completely. I lose interest in doing anything. I, I, I lose the, 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 the drive to get out of bed. I, I'm not that kind of a person. I'm out of bed at 4.30, but I found myself in bed at 7 o'clock uh, a.m. because there's a part of me that says, get up and do what? And so what? There's this emptiness in me, this hollowness inside of me mm-hmm. um, that, that has robbed me of the drive. I'm just, I'm beginning to get back to it. But so in a nutshell, that, that's, the, that's the answer to your question, uh, Bishop. When we were talking earlier, um, you spoke about sighing, um, mm-hmm. that you find yourself, you know, sighing. That's, uh, that, that's an expression of a cry from within mm-hmm. you. How, how does that play out mm. oh it's it's um <laughs> so my wife does it um i do it my daughter is doing it um it's uh it, it, and i do it i think about around about 10 times or even more a day um and i said to myself i should stop doing this but i can't stop it i find myself groaning i some i find myself sighing quite a lot I find myself shaking my head mm. um, as in disbelief because I have this movie running in my, in my head, the movie of seeing my niece lying dead on her bed, just mm. 30 minutes, 30 minutes after I'd seen and talked to her and oh. she, was li- she was laughing. Uh, I have this, the, 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 the vision of, of seeing my mother in the casket Mm-hmm. Um, and those keep on playing. I think this is what comes back to me and causes me to sigh and causes me to groan um, so many times during the day. Hmm. Let's let's um, talk a little bit about your seeing your mum, you know, in a casket. <clears throat> the, the funeral, the funeral of your mother. Um, how, how did you process that? Um, how did you manage to uh, stop the crowds from coming? <clears throat> I, I, I think I'm right right now. I am very unpopular within the extended family, uh, Bishop. I, having seen the infections uh, within the family, um, let me share with you that uh, as I'm talking to you right now, we have seven members of the family that attended my father's funeral um, that are recovering from COVID, who tested positive. Thank God they are recovering and they are mm. all, in, all in good shape. Having seen that, my, my, my young brother who comes after me, him, his wife, and his daughter were unable to attend my mother's, my mother's funeral because they tested positive. I then, I, I say I'm, I'm unpopular in the extended family because I, just, I then put my foot down and said, only 16 people are going to attend. It's got to be as small as possible. So only 16 people attended my mother's funeral. This is a woman who was known in political circles. This is a woman who was known very much within a senior within the Brethren in Christ Church in, 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 in Bulawayo, where a lot of people would have wanted to be their farewell. But we had to say it cannot happen. We locked the gates and made sure that only 16 people attended. That in itself is very painful. That in itself is very lonely. Her relatives in Gwanda could not come because we simply said they could not come. That in itself just, you know, instead of you having relatives and friends, uh, you know, giving you occasion to laugh and so forth, you find yourself just 16 of you standing around uh, to to bid farewell to an amazing woman. Uh, That is painful. That is painful. 
that must be very difficult to process. And of course, there will be some uh, repercussions that you're going to have to face with family. Uh, there's going to be uh, some mending offenses that you'll have to do. But if you're talking about a funeral with 16 people and seven of them end up, you know, infected, I would imagine that you did manage, you did insist on some of the the the, uh, the precautions, masking and 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 all of that. And yet, with with that, still you had that situation. Talk to me a little bit about if you had had the opportunity to speak to your parents before that, were there some questions that you'd have wanted to, conversations that you'd have wanted to have with them? You know, the, the, when dad was um, uh, taken to hospital and, and mom uh, was still at home, we were still in a position to laugh. And I called my mother and said, you know, I know who brought this thing home. And your mother says, oh, we know, we're laughing about it, but please don't say it to your father because he is talking to himself. He says, I'm the one who brought this. I should not, not have gone to the pub. So we were planning that if dad comes out from hospital, we're going to sit him down and say, you see, sometimes you really need to listen to us because you didn't listen to us. Um, you went to the pub. We suspect maybe this is how this thing came home. Hmm. Um, I, I had a wonderful relationship with my mother. Um, uh, you know, sometimes I'd call her by her first name and she'd laugh, she would enjoy it. You know, I'd call her Alima and she says, when you call me by my first name, I know you are, you are, you are, you are missing me. Um, there, there's so much I would have wanted to, 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 to say to them, um, to, to, to my father to say, look, you, you have relatives in, 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 in Zambia. Uh, if, if you're saying cheers right now, what message do you have for them? Please know that we'll remain uh, you know, in touch and that kind of stuff. There's so much that I would have wanted to say if only I was given the opportunity to hold their hands and sit by the bedside. Like I've done a couple of times, uh, Bishop, when they've not been well. But this disease, uh, um, this pandemic just makes it impossible to do that. Yeah, yeah. So what what we are talking about here, Trevor, is is typical of what's happening in the nation. It's it's multiplied, you know, many times over. This is precisely what is happening, and this is the pain mm. that you know we are facing um, as a nation. Uh, people are just not having closure. People are having you know many questions, and in some cases, in some cases. A blaming, you know, there's a, a, a blaming of you brought this home. And, uh, you know, if you had not gone to that place, if you had not done this, you know, it would not have happened. And so <clears throat> we have a, a big, you know, um, task ahead of us in terms of bringing comfort to the nation, uh, helping people, you know, deal with this and, you know, processing this whole thing, the impact of this is absolutely, you know, mm. uh, horrendous at different levels. Uh, perhaps we could, you know, touch on some of those levels, the, the impact of the, you know, of the pandemic and uh, the grief that people are going through. Uh, let, let, is... me, let, me pre let me stop you, uh, Bishop, there and say, um, you, you've already spoken about this, the, the lack of closure. What does that do to a nation, uh, Bishop, in, in, in your mind? Because it, it looks like, is, there's a lot of people like me walking around, uh, Bishop, without this closure, walking around with these questions that are not answered. That cannot be good for the national psyche. It, it is a heavy burden on our psyche, you know, as a nation. And uh, it just brings a lot of insecurity, you know, on people. Uh, Trevor, we're going to have to deal with, you know, um, issues of, uh, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder. Right. Um, we're going to have to do a lot in that area spiritually. Um, uh, there's a lot of healing that needs to take place. Uh, we really need um, help from above to, you know, to deal with this as a nation. Otherwise, it's going to be very difficult for wholeness to return. It's going to take some time for wholeness to return to people's lives. Like you say, um, using you as a case study on this you know, particular um, situation, like you say for you, uh, the, the, the hollowness, the emptiness, the inability 
uh, to the lethargy that you you felt. Mm. Uh, this is what we're going to be experiencing. And for those few who have jobs, this is what they're experiencing right now. Mm. They, they just are not able to throw themselves into what needs to happen. And we still have lives to live. We still have, you know, families to feed. We still have to deliver, you know, in work environments and so on. It's going to be very difficult. Essentially, what you're saying, uh, Bishop, is, is that uh, we we're showing up, we're going to show up in workplaces, but we're not bringing hundred percent of ourselves. That's what you're saying, Bishop. Absolutely, um, your mind is, your body is there, mm. but your mind is not there mm. um, because you have this, you know, you have these pictures running through your head, you have these questions running through your head, you have these regrets. Um, you know, running through your head, there is so much, you know, going on, you know, in your head. And in some cases, fear, you know, you're saying to yourself, I'm in this environment, um, what does it mean for me? Mm -hmm. For instance, let's talk about, I mean, we could, we could touch on service providers. Yeah, yeah. What does this mean for our doctors, our nurses, um, funeral parlors, uh, who are experiencing so much a death, you know, um, in, in some cases, they become mechanical, you know, about, about processing death because mm. they are processing so many funerals. Uh, the human element, you know, almost disappears. These are yeah. some of the impacts. Uh, I'm sure, you know, you've been exposed to, you know, some of this. Um, how, how was your situation in terms of, you know, uh, mom's uh, funeral? Um, did, you, did you feel, I mean, Nyaradzo are, are some of the best, you know, in the country. The services they've provided in the past have been, have been so, so tremendous. Are, are standards still the same? The, I think the, the honest truth is that um, you, you're correct that because of the many deaths, give you an example, uh, in Wulawayo, the Athlon Cemetery, where we laid both my mom and, and, and dad uh, to rest, um, the Sunday that we did that, there were 20 funerals, and they stopped funerals at 12 o'clock. Out, out of those 20, nine were COVID-related. Um, so the, the, the hearses almost go up and down. The same hearse goes to pick up uh, uh, two separate ca caskets or three caskets. Uh, and I was talking to some of the pretty senior uh, within uh, this organization and saying, you know, previously they would do only one or two, but they're now doing between five and, 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 and six. So clearly the burden is there and it begins, it, you lose uh, that personal touch, you lose that respect, you lose that dignity. So a lot of that is gone or because of the pressure that understandably uh, the, the people that are, are handling uh, these funerals are being subjected to. And, and then we talk about, um, um, you know, medical personnel, you know, doctors and, and so on. You know, we have uh, in our fellowship, we have a lot of uh, medical people, a lot of doctors and, and so on who work in the, in the health sector. People who are really committed to serving the nation. What, what impact does this have on them when they give themselves to doing the best they can and yet still lose people. Oh, it's, it's, I can it's, imagine, I mean, what happens to uh, someone going home, you know, you, you, you had given, you, you'd done all you could for this patient and you expected them to leave and suddenly they are gone. Yeah, the, uh, I'll share with you the doctor, my mother's doctor, who unfortunately did not have, uh, did not attend to my mother as COVID case. Uh, he got tested positive a couple of days after my mother's uh, bur uh, burial, mm. uh, but nothing to do with my mother. And, and he says to me, uh, Trevor, I'm sure I always have my N95 uh, mask. I think I touched my, uh, uh, I touched something and then touched my eyes uh, because my eyes immediately became red. 
But the, why I mention him, Bishop, is because he says to me, Trevor, this is so heartbreaking. These are patients that we've worked with. Your mother had uh, was hypertensive and had diabetes, but she has lived with this condition for a very long time and we've taken care of her. But this thing has taken her out. And he says, I'm seeing most of this, of this happening. And it's causing us to, to lose heart. It's affecting us. It's, it's causing us to ask ourselves the, the, the question in the morning when I dress up, where am I going if I'm not going to be able mm. to save the kind of lives that I was able to? So can you imagine that multiplied across our entire uh, uh, frontline workers, doctors and nurses, uh, you know, the people at funeral homes? That's what the nation is dealing with at the moment. Yeah, that's part of the that's part of the grieving that that we are going through. Um, apart from the inability to you know save people, uh, you've got just the massive burden on the physical you know mm-hmm. aspect of things where they are overstretched. Yeah, they are working you know long hours, long hours. understaffed, under resourced, and that must you know have a tremendous burden. Uh, on them as well. I'll share there a nurse uh, at the place where my mother was uh, was 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 being taken care of um, was overheard by my brother when he tried to go and have a, uh, see what how my mother was doing. She says to the matron, "Matron, we have to decide to either take few people and take good care of them, or employ more of us." so that we take care of these people that are here. We are simply not coping. That's one institution in Bulawayo. Mm. Imagine what's happening elsewhere across the country. Yeah. And some of the decisions that they have to make, I mean, you talk about, um, you know, equipment, you talk about, um, you know, these oxygen, you know, machines and so on. And, And sometimes having to take a machine from one patient and use it on another patient, you know, I mean... (laughs) Or, or graduate a patient who seems to be better um, and put the machine, uh, you know, on someone who is even worse than that. These are difficult decisions that our, our medical personnel, our front lines, you know, people are having to face. And uh, emotionally, it's going to take a toll on them. Yeah. We, we are going to have, there's a big price we're going to pay, mm. you know, as far as our, med- our front line, you know, people are concerned. Mm. Um, you know, going forward, um, because there's there's only so much that they can take. Absolutely. Let, let me let me move us, uh, uh, Bishop, to an area that you'd be familiar with. Um, a number of pastors uh, have 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 jumped into the scene and caused quite a lot of confusion, and indeed, politicians. Um, you know, don't take vaccines because of A, B, C, D, and so forth. And you get a sense when you look at social media that these are influential people who are causing uh, their congregations to take a certain view as far as vaccines are concerned. What, 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 what are you picking up and what's your position on, 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 on that, that, those kind of pronouncements? Trevor, it's unfortunate that um, we've had some of this, you are right, we've had some of these you know, influences from um, religious leaders, um, One thing that we have to be cognizant of is the fact that, you know, our spiritual leaders have a lot of influence on people. And when they pronounce, you know, certain statements, they are taken seriously. Mm -hmm. And so what you have is you have a lot of conspiracy theories that are doing the rounds. There are those who've said, you know, you can't take this. This is part of triple six. And, um, um, you know, it's, 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 it's part of the, the end time, you know, um, uh, um, you know, challenges that we're going to face and you shouldn't take this. It's, it's, it's part of the devil. Uh, there are those, you know, who've given um, uh, heed to the fact that, you know, uh, the West is trying to kill us. They are trying to, you know, reduce uh, populations and, and stuff like that. So you have all these conspiracy theories that are float, floating around. And some of the men of God and women of God, in my view, have led to some of the deaths that we've experienced because people could have taken, you know, vaccinations, but they didn't because they had trusted their pastors. And so it's a, a sad reality 
my position is that we've got to you know go with 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 science that i do not see a clash between religion and science i i feel that you know god has given wisdom mm-hmm. uh, to doctors to you know um scientists and so on and they've been able to save lives um if we could just touch on some of these theories i mean if the yeah. west wanted to kill us um they could have been doing that you know quite successfully we've been taking vaccines you know uh, since we were kids yeah so they didn't have to kill you know so many of their own they didn't have to spend you know so much money uh, developing these medicines and spend them on their own people first in order to kill us mm. i mean the, the logic just isn't there at all mm. and then of course there's this question of where did the covid come from mm. you know it was created uh, in a lab you know some people will say it was created in a lab in china and so on where it came from is immaterial to us at this point mm. in time the fact is we've got this pandemic and how do we deal with it mm. some of the some of those questions we may never know the people who whoever is behind this if there is someone behind it they are not telling and they are not going to tell mm-hmm. and some of those truths will never know absolutely uh, i am not taking a position on in terms of you know where it came from and i don't know mm-hmm. we don't know mm-hmm. but the fact is we have this situation now what do we do with it what do we you know how do we deal with it and your position is let's follow science <laughs> let's follow science yeah. um i i was i i i got vaccinated first thing you know yeah. first opportunity that I, had, that i had i got vaccinated and i went public on that mm. uh, you know just told everybody that i got got vaccinated and uh i was encouraging i've always encouraged you know everybody uh, to get vaccinated at the earliest opportunity i'll tell you this right now um trevor i am cross mm. i am cross with some of my friends who've died mm. in in harare mm. i have fellow christian leaders who've died or are in a hospital and it's all because they listen to these you know mm. theories mm. some of them could be alive today i know from a spiritual you know point of view we say it was god's time and so on but we got to you know apply wisdom here absolutely. and say there are consequences to the decisions we make absolutely 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 you you touch on a, on a point which um you hear a lot of people raise a uh, bishop where is god in all this why is our god allowing this kind of suffering what response do you give to somebody who asks that question a very tough question <laughs> where is god in all this god is where he has always been he is on the throne mm. he is in control <clears throat> mm. um this is not the first time that uh, there has been you know a virus there has been you know there've been uh, viruses throughout the history of mankind uh these viruses sometimes you know are, are natural they come naturally uh, they are a consequence of you know uh humanity and and human sin sometimes these viruses are a punishment you you get situations in the bible where you know a virus was a punishment for sin um i have several instances you know that i could give you in uh moses in egypt some of the plagues that the befell the egyptians were god punishing the egyptians uh, in the in the wilderness um they were bitten by serpents at some point you know as a result of sin david has sins you know against the lord and numbers you know the israelites and and god sends a plague and kills 70,000 people and so on. so there there've been vi- viruses you know all along so where is god in all this god yeah. is with us mm. despite the pain that we are going through he is on the throne mm. and he cares amen amen let, let me um i i have a, a difficulty in processing uh when people say to me be strong um when all i want to do is to be weak to cry um just to let go to deal with the emotion to let it to let it wash off 
And I say to myself, do they mean, I think when they say I should be strong, they mean that I should recognize that I can't change what God has done. But being strong does not mean that I must pretend I don't have emotions and I don't feel the pain. Can, can you help us in dealing with that when people say to you, be strong, and you've just lost your father, your mother, and your niece? What does that mean, be strong? You know, I, I feel that we probably need to change our approach as far as that is concerned. Trevor, it's okay to not to be okay. Mm. It's okay for you to get up in the morning and say, I don't feel like doing anything. It's okay for you as, as a leader, the, the kind of person, uh, the, 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 the position that you hold in society, it's okay for you to admit that you're not okay. Mm. You know, we live in a world that despises weakness, mm. but God uses weakness. Mm. And I feel that we do you a disservice when we stop you from crying and don't give you the opportunity to cry. That's why we need relationships that, you know, are safe, mm. where it's okay for me to, to go to my brothers uh, and I'm not looking for an answer from them. Yeah. I'm not asking them to, to heal me. I just want to cry. I just want yeah. to be me. Yeah. I just want to be vulnerable. I think we should allow people to moan. It's, it's okay to cry. Yeah. It's okay to say, I'm not okay. Yeah. And, and, I, and, and, and I would go even further to say, it's okay to be weak. That is strength in itself. It's okay to say, I, I, I can't take it anymore. I'm just going to lie down here. I'm going to cry. Uh, that is strength in itself. Um, what, with the, the reason why I raise it is I get a sense sometimes when people say be strong, it's as if you, you, you just got to go on as if nothing happened, but you cannot. So th thank you uh, for, for, for the way that you've responded uh, to, 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 that, to that issue. Um, you, you, you mentioned, uh, Bishop, that we need to do, we've got to deal with post-traumatic uh, post, uh, traumatic, uh, stress disorder. How do we do it? It appears to me that what we're dealing with right now is a space that we've never been to. to. I mean, I'm hearing, um, Bishop, I lost three people, very close, uh, three close people. I'm hearing families that are losing five people, six people, husband losing a uh, wife and a daughter and remaining alone. We're dealing with a national crisis where we collectively need a shoulder to cry on. We need some healing of some sort when this thing is done, is done. But I look around and say, is anybody looking at this? Apart from looking for vaccines and PPEs, who is focused on the healing that needs to be done once this is over? Sadly, um, I would have to say at this moment in time, I do not see you know, a, a focus on, on healing. I think we're still, you know, so caught up uh, in the pandemic itself and, you know, some of the solutions. I do not see uh, government, you know, doing this at this moment in time. I think they are, you know, caught up in the pandemic and in providing, you know, um, uh, uh, vaccinations and so on. I think that the church has a responsibility to help in this area. Um, I think there is a spiritual element that we bring to this that is of comfort, you know, to the nation. Mm. Um, the, the spiritual element, the, 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 the positive, you know, uh, look toward God, uh, the element of faith, you know, trusting God in this situation to bring us through. The comfort that, you know, the scriptures bring, the, the, the presence of the spirit of God who is, you know, our comforter. That element, I think the church has a responsibility to bring. But also, uh, I would also hasten to add that I think there is a psychological aspect that we have to come into this. Mm -hmm. uh, we will need help from professionals, you know, 
people are going to need professional counseling in mm. some situations. Mm. I, as a pastor, there's only so much that I can do. You know, mm. pastors are limited in how much, you know, what help they can bring. Uh, I, I think we're going to have to link arms uh, with, you know, service providers to actually make sure that we deliver, you know, healing to the nation. Mm. There's going to be, you know, there's going to have to be counseling centers where people can go and, and just, you know, um, find therapy. Mm. Uh, there's programs that I think, you know, we're going to have to come up with uh, mm. to help people to recover. Mm. And, and culturally, we also are not always ready for death. We don't prepare for death. Speak to us, uh, Bishop, about preparing for death, which is not an easy thing. Um, in our culture, when you start preparing for death, people say, oh, no, don't talk about your death the way you, 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 you are doing. It's not a good thing. Um, talk to us about the, 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 the will and final testament and uh, uh, the living will. Um, how, how do we go about that? How do we prepare ourselves for death? so that those that remain behind uh, are not left in, uh, in confusion and disagreement. A quick aside on this, um, uh, Trevor. Um, soon after I got married in the early 80s, my wife asked me what I wanted to see happen at my funeral. Mm -hmm. Being a typical African man, I hit the roof. I just, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we've just gotten married and you're talking about my death. Are you planning it already? Well, cut a long story short, after I calmed down, it helped me to begin, you know, um, thinking seriously about death. And I began talking to, you know, our, our church at the time about preparing for your death. Right. That every one of us has got to live with that in mind. Mm. If the Lord tarries, Trevor, you and I are going to die. Mm. And it is important that we prepare for that day. Mm. Beginning with the end in mind is always, you know, very mm. crucial. So what does that mean? For me, it means, number one, that you tidy your affairs. Okay. You make sure that your life doesn't have too many loose ends, unfinished projects, decisions that have not been made, you know, uh, transactions that have not been completed and all of that. Make sure that you tuck in all the loose ends. Never do tomorrow yeah. what you can do today. today. Mm -hmm. In other words, make sure that your life is in order. In the Bible, they talk about, you know, go and put your house in order. Make sure that your house is in order. That's the first thing. I think the second thing is that everyone needs to have a will. Mm -hmm. Everyone, particularly the African male, we need to have wills. As a pastor, I've dealt with situations where someone dies and the widow is left, you know, bereft by the family, you know, who suddenly feel entitled to their son's, you know, um, assets and things like that. It is absolutely crucial. And sometimes, you know, um, you have squabbles, you have fights uh, that, that happen, you know, after the, the, the departure of someone uh, because they didn't have a will. So a will is an absolute must, I feel. It's very important to always have a will. Sometimes people say, well, I don't have assets and I don't have much, so there's no... No, have one in place because mm. you just never know what happens, how God blesses you and what position you are at, you know, when you die. Mm. So a, 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 a will is very important. It, it doesn't have to be an expensive thing. You know, it can be just a document that is registered somewhere, um, you know, um, signed by, you know, in front of a, a, a register of oaths and so on. And, and that, that, that will suffice. And then I also talk about a living will. Mm. You talk about, you know, um, COVID and what it's doing right now. Uh, there are moments when someone is in a coma or is in intensive care and decisions have to be made about their life. And a living will is important where you instruct your family what decision you would like them to take if you were incapacitated mm. and were unable to make the decision yourself. We have situations where, for instance, you know, a wife is struggling to pay the bills because mm. the husband is in a coma or something like that. And she's doing everything she can to keep him alive. Mm. 
when medical opinion has stated that there are no chances of this yeah. person surviving. And she has to make the call. And she's facing the family yeah. who, you know, will accuse her of killing their, you know, their son or whatever, you know, if she makes the call. And so a living will, you know, is very, very important. So tucking in your loose ends, making sure that your life is in order, having a, a living will and, and, and ha- having a will and a living will. And, and for our pastors, I normally say, I want by your bedside, final instructions on how you want to be buried. Right. Because we've had situations where a man of God or a woman of God ends up being buried like a heathen Mm. because culturally, you know, their, you know, family says, you know, this is how we want uh, to bury, you know, our son or our daughter. And so those instructions are very, very helpful and, you know, they avoid a lot of confusion. When we've buried someone whose life has been, you know, together, where mm-hmm. they've put things in order, it's so, so peaceful, Trevor. Mm, it is. Uh, and, and there's just, it's a celebration. Yeah. You know, yeah. you don't feel like this person has been taken away from us. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's like they, they finished their job mm-hmm. and they've gone home. It is done. It is, it is done. done. Yeah, it, help help me deal with an issue which um, <clears throat> uh, I found myself grappling with. How long must I grieve? <clears throat> and then I went into the Bible. Um, David fasts for uh, his son to be healed by God, and uh, he fasts. He, he he tears his clothes, his sad cloth, and that kind of stuff. And then when he can't, he doesn't eat. And, but when, the, when they come and say, your son is dead, David washes himself uh, and dresses nicely and say, can you give me some food? I fasted when he was sick, but now that he's gone, um, I'm going to carry on with my life. Uh, Saul, um, Samuel rather, uh, when, when God says Saul is not going to be the king uh, of uh, the Israelites, um, Samuel mourns. But God comes to him and says, are you still mourning? Get up and fill your horn with oil. And I'm like, okay, how long should I fast God? Should I do it the way David did it or the way Samuel did it? Talk to us, uh, uh, Bishop, about how long must I mourn? It's it's a real question right now, Bishop. I don't know. Should I have taken six months leave? Uh, Should I have taken a month's leave, a week's leave? How long should I mourn? That is a, a very difficult question, Trevor, to which, you know, no one can prescribe, you know, precisely how long you should mourn. Some people are able to get over <clears throat> the situation by, you know, a step over it and be able to function normally within a short period of time. Others, you know, it, it takes months, sometimes years, um, for them to uh, to grieve and get to you know a closure, uh, I do not think that we should prescribe how long you should mourn. Um, I think it's a healing process, okay. and uh, take as long as you need to take. Obviously, uh, life has to go on, mm. and there's that aspect where we have to help you get to terms with what has happened. And for you to move on, to take, you know, the next step, it will still be very painful. The loss of your parents isn't something that you're going to get over tomorrow. Yeah. Um, It may be with you for a long time. I pray that the impact of it will not be such that it will incapacitate you. Mm -hmm. I pray that you'll find, you know, comfort and healing. Mm -hmm. But we cannot dictate to you how long you should mourn. Mm -hmm. Um, We should just let, you know... Um, uh, the tears roll. Um, you will wake up one day feeling on top of the world and then some incident will happen and it will take you right back and it will be like you're it's starting fresh. all over again. Yeah. You know, yeah. so it's not something that anybody uh, can, can, can tell you to get over. We can help you with processes of handling it. Yeah. But in terms of how long you should moan, I don't think anybody can prescribe that. Mm. Are, are there any practical suggestions that you have, uh, Bishop, about healing? 
what are the practical handles that you you might suggest to people about healing and and, and bring about closure i think that Yes, there are several things that, that, that we can do. Um, information, knowledge is very important. Um, the Bible says that, you know, my people perish for lack of knowledge. Mm. And uh, I believe that we should arm ourselves as much as possible with the information on this virus you know, as much as we can. For instance, I feel that there's a lot of ignorance uh, out there in terms of what this virus is. Yeah. You know, it's like it's something that creeps in during the night mm. uh, while you're sleeping. There's nothing you can do about it. But we need to know the science behind this, that this is an airborne, you know, virus, mm. that you breathe it in. Yeah that you, you, you are infected through contaminated surfaces, mm -hmm. uh, like this doctor, you know, talking about you know, yeah. touching something and then rubbing his eyes and stuff like that. It comes in through the eyes, through the nose, through the mouth and so on. We need to know the stages of, you know, what happens with this disease. I mean, with this virus, that initially it's in the nose and it's in, it's in the throat and it's in the, in the back, of your, back of your throat and your nose. And, and that, that is the best time to deal with it when you, you know, have those initial symptoms mm -hmm. because it's still working its way in. And you need to understand how it develops from there and goes to the lungs. Yeah. That, you know, if, if, when it gets to the lungs, you are fighting for your life. Mm -hmm. And we need to know the science behind some of what, you know, needs to be done at each of those stages to either avoid completely, you know, being infected or what you should do when you are infected. Mm. Now, that knowledge for me, I think, you know, is, is very important because, you know, it frees people to take decisions and, yeah. and it takes away fear. Mm. It takes away fear and it helps us to take the appropriate steps that we need to take mm. uh, in order to avoid, you know, the, the uh, contamination or in terms of what to do when we are, when we are infected. Yeah. And then, and then I think that it is important for us to break some norms and, and come to a new normal. Yeah. Uh, in terms of handling funerals, uh, in terms of, you know, our exposure, uh, this will help us, you know, to avoid, you know, spreading uh, the, the, uh, the pandemic. And then I, I'd like to touch on the element of accountability groups. Right. Trevor, right now, you know, you, you have friends. Yeah. You do have your own circle of friends. Uh, you know, people who can... Uh, you know, come around you at times like this. Yeah. I have friends, for instance, that I've walked with since the early 70s when I gave my life to the Lord. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a close-knit, you know, friends. We're, we're, we're a close-knit group of friends. And we are in various countries, but we still communicate with one another mm -hmm. uh, in good times and in bad times. Mm -hmm. And when I'm not feeling good, that's the place I run to. Mm -hmm. We need those close relationships. You know, what COVID has done, it has exposed the phoniness mm. and the emptiness of our relationships. Wow, wow. You know, where, you know, you thought you had friends, but all of a sudden you realize you mm. don't actually have friends. Mm. Mm. So we need to get back to that place where we have those, you know, relationships. Some of them are a vertical, mm. you know, I have a pastor who I've walked with all these years. He mm. knows me inside mm. out mm. And, and I am trans, you know, with mm. him. I have lateral relationships, like I'm saying about, you know, guys that I've worked with, you know, since the early 70s. And then I've got people beneath me who are looking up to me. Mm. And the, the ability to help others, when I talk about those beneath me, the ability to give yourself to others is also therapeutic. Mm. Because when we focus on ourselves only mm. and we get closed in, well, we get into a mess. 
Absolutely. But when you're able to give out to others, that's therapeutic. When you're able to focus on other people and, and finding ways of helping them, I believe that that is therapeutic. So those are some of the things that I believe, you know, are helpful in helping us to heal. I've also found, uh, Pastor, I don't know, uh, 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 Bishop Brother, I don't know what you think about it. I think for me, uh, the past few days where I've fi- I'm finally picking myself up, the things that I found very useful, uh, uh, the first thing that I do when I get up is an hour's uh, physical exercise. Uh, after that, uh, a moment to uh, 20, 30 minutes to read my Bible, to pray and to meditate. After that, to journal, to write down what happened yes- yesterday. That in itself helps me put things into perspective and begin to process uh, issue issues. So I found that process to be very, very helpful. And it helps, I think, having um, a supportive uh, family, stru- fam- family structure. Do you have anything to add, add to that? Yes, I do. <clears throat> um, one of the things that happens in situations like this is that you become lethargic mm. and uh, your health it begins to deteriorate yeah. when you don't look after yourself. <clears throat> yeah. uh, the aspect of exercise is absolutely you know, critical. <clears throat> Trevor, I, I belong to a working group and um, uh, we are given targets every week. <clears throat> The usual target is about is about 50 kilometers a week. Wow. Last week I, I did a hundred kilometers. Wow. I walked hundred kilometers in seven days. This is a, a strong, you know, uh, accountability group where if you don't meet your target, they are chasing after you and saying, What's going on? You're gonna be fined. Yeah. <laughs> um we have pictures just today. We, we had two, you know, men show their before and after, you know, pictures. <laughs> you should see their massive bodies before they started walking. <laughs> and you should see them now. They are fit. Oh, wow. That increases your ability to fight diseases. Your immune system, you know, builds up when you're healthy. Mm. So the aspect of exercise, I am so so please that you you are you you are focusing on that. Mm. It's important to have a regime of some kind. Mm. You know, when when that breaks down, your life goes into chaos. Mm. But if you can maintain some of those habits, like exercise, making sure that you are eating properly, uh, making sure that you are journaling, some of those regular things that you are doing. I believe they're therapeutic, and I believe that they have. Tell us any 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 other things. What what are some of what, what have you found helpful in terms of friends? Uh, are there any aspects that you found helpful? Uh, absolutely, I think the the I, I do have an accountability partner uh, who who pushes me very hard uh, on 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 these kind of issues. You know, how are you feeling? Um, you know, don't answer that question in a superficial kind of way. I mean, exactly how are you feeling? I think that that's, that helps, you know, knowing that you have uh, somebody who you can be vulnerable with, uh, completely open and tell and cry if you need to cry uh, and, and, and tell them, share with them your, your, your deep secrets about where you are. And, and that for me has, has been absolutely helpful in addition to, uh, to uh, what I've just outlined. I've also had an amazing relationship with, uh, with, with my wife. Uh, an amazing partner over the past uh, 20 years. I mean, uh, we have uh, 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 a, a family uh, ritual where breakfast is breakfast together. That's where we, we touch base in the morning. Uh, the two of us, we sit and we have breakfast. Uh, dinner is dinner with the whole family where we sit down and say, what were the highs and what were, what, what were the laws? That is so important uh, for, for, for downloading, for uploading, and, and, and just for, for feeling uh, acceptable and, uh, and uh, yeah, feeling acceptable and, 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 and inspired, as it were. So those, those, those are some of the rituals that we, we do have as a family. A very, a very important thing, Trevor, um, when you look at what you know, COVID has done to many families, uh, the pressure of being together has actually mm. brought disintegration in some families. Yeah. Some families, you know, got to find out who they were and didn't like, you know, yeah. what they, they, they discovered. 
about one another. Yeah. All of a sudden, you know, I mean, they were running, you know, in different directions and would come together at night, but now they're forced to spend, you know, 24 seven together and they yeah. couldn't handle yeah. it. Yeah. So some families have broken down mm. spiritually as well. You know, people depended on the pastor. Mm. They depended on the, on the service mm. Sunday morning, you know, Sunday school, mm. uh, the children, you know, would be given their lessons in Sunday school and, there wasn't the, the father was not the prophet, priest, and king of his home. Mm. And consequently, you know, he could not deliver. Yeah. And what has happened is, well, chaos now reigns. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I'm so glad that you mentioned the aspect of family, mm. uh, the spiritual element, the father, you know, taking mm. his place. Uh, mm. The gathering is the family around the, the family table and having a family altar. Absolutely. You know, praying together. Yeah. And these are vital elements that, you know, COVID in some families, you know, has strengthened. Absolutely. Uh, but sadly, in other families, you know, it's been the opposite. Oh, Pastor, this has been absolutely uh, helpful to me. And I have no doubt that it's going to be hugely helpful to uh, the thousands of people that uh, follow uh, this show every week. Can I press you as we end, uh, uh, Bishop, to uh, uh, share with us any books uh, that are relevant to the, the issues that we've been talking about and maybe some of your favorite books that you'd want to, uh, to share? Uh, the people that watch this show absolutely love books. So do you have any books to share? You'll forgive me, they are not on grief and healing. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> These are books that, you know, have really, you know, influenced my life. Obviously, it yeah. goes without saying. The Bible. <laughs> that, you know, this book is number one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you don't expect a different answer. No, okay? absolutely. <laughs> this book is number one. <laughs> yeah. I've read this book since 1972. I read it daily. Yeah. Uh, today, actually, I'm celebrating a second round this year of reading from Genesis to Genesis Revelation. To Revelations. Wow. Yes, we just got to the end. There's a group of us that have been doing this, um, and we just got to the end of the second round, you know, for me. So uh, I'll be starting next month. I'll be starting on the third round. So can I can I share really with important. can I share with you also? I, I started this habit uh, uh, after my good friend uh, Strive Masiwa challenged me to it. I, I now read uh, the Bible at least once, if not twice a year, uh, from Genesis uh, to Revelations. And it has helped me quite a lot in understanding what the word is all about. And, you know, you, it's amazing that every reading, you keep on discovering new things. So that's yeah. a habit that I really would encourage uh, every Christian to do, rather than depending on the pastor to read the Bible yeah. for you on Sunday. Yeah. There's a washing. There's a Absolutely. washing that happens. Ephesians 5.26 talks about the washing of the regeneration yes. of the water of the word. Yes. It just washes your spirit. Uh, you go to Psalms. I, I like the fact that we can be so secure in our, in our faith that we can ask questions. Yes. We can interrogate our faith. Yes. And, and, you know, Psalms is one of those places where you can ask questions and challenge yes. Yeah. situations you know david goes to god and says god what what's 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 going on here yeah. i mean job why, why are you silent <laughs> you know are you that kind of stuff so number yeah. one book number That's one is great this. i mean yeah. we can talk all after all you know, absolutely this, yeah. yeah the second book that that i'd recommend is a book called in his steps uh -huh. by charles sheldon mm -hmm. you know i read this book as a young believer and i want to tell you it just impacted my life so much. It talks about what Jesus would do in any situation, mm -hmm. following in his footsteps. Um, it's, it, it, it just impacted my life. And then you've come across this one quite, you know, often. Uh, yes. Yes. How yes. to win friends and influence people. <laughs> yes. I'm telling you in terms of my relationships, this guy set my tone. Wow. Yeah talk to people out here, conversations, powerful books that, you know, impacted me. I read it as a young believer and I still read it today. Fantastic. Um, there's a, a book by Leroy M. Ems, The Leader, Be the Leader You Were Meant to Be. Mm. Uh, 
influence my leadership style and you know philosophy. And uh, another one, John Edison, What Makes a Leader? Just a small little book. Mm. Um, these are books that have really you know, impacted my life. Fantastic. Bishop Kandler, thank you so much uh, for uh, agreeing uh, to, to be so helpful to me as I grieve uh, my mother, my father, and my niece. I have no doubt that in doing so, you've helped uh, quite a lot of people that are going through what I'm going through and some that are going through even worse circumstances. The nation faces uh, a crisis, a crisis of failure of closure, a crisis where leaders are, are grieving and they're not found in closure, where people are looking for healing. Your words uh, will go a long way in helping people navigate their way uh, around the crisis and the grief that, that they are in. So thank you so much. Allow me, uh, Bishop, as we end, for me to address myself to our viewers who are in Zimbabwe, who are on the continent, uh, and who are all over the world, who have made this show the success that it is. Thank you for watching. And remember, that we are a weekly show. We are up at 7 a.m. Central African time every morning. And to ensure that you don't miss out in any of these quality conversations, I invite you to click on this red, red button and subscribe. We've also created podcasts. Uh, scroll down before below this uh, video and click on the link that you find there for the podcast for your listening, listening pleasure. So until next time, cheers to you all. Mm -hmm.